Welcome back to another episode of the Effort of Everything podcast. I'm your host, Jason Kleep, and on today's episode, Gabe Giannis and I were back on the mic talking about workouts, talking about law enforcement, talking about nutrition, and aiming low, discussing this concept of the discipline bucket. I love this concept Gabe dove into. I'm gonna make sure to talk about it even more on a couple of clip in the future that's called the discipline bucket. Make sure to enjoy this episode, listen through it. We talk about it towards the end. Keep crushing it. Have a great day. Let's go. We're officially recording, Gabe. We've been talking for a while about a bunch of different things. You know, anytime we start these uh, conversations, half the time we start off talking about like business, then we get into a little bit of fitness, and then we start recording. And so now here we are. Um, I had a hell of a workout yesterday I wanted to just tell you about. It's going to be uh, my workout of the week that I thought I'd start the podcast with. Um, it was uh, two deadlifts at 315, four bar muscle-ups, eight box jump overs. And um, Liz put it up on social media and she was trying to have people guess how many rounds it is, but it's 10 rounds. So 10 round workout, uh, two deadlifts at 315, four bar muscle-ups and eight box jump overs. But I want to say for those people listening who are listening to this and be like, bro, I cannot do two deadlifts at 315, four bar muscle-ups and eight box jump overs. No problem. Instead, adjust it down to an appropriate weight on the deadlift, whether that's 225, 135, something you could do two reps with. Um, double overhand, mixed grip, whatever the hell you want, but with good position. And then instead of the bur uh, bar muscle-ups, perform a burpee pull-up. And so what that is, just perform a burpee right underneath the bar. You can do a strict pull-up, you can do a kipping pull-up, but do the same, do four, and then go to your box jump overs and do that for 10 rounds. Your goal should be to get under 10 minutes. That'd be a good goal. So that's the workout of the week. That's where we're starting off this conversation. Let's rock and roll. And that's coming up in the programming, right? You were testing that yesterday as part of like the coaches get together, test a bunch of workouts. Yeah. So that's coming up. So at NC fit, you know, we, we have our coaches get together every Tuesday um, just to kind of like throw down together. But in, 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 I'd say generally we test workouts that are coming up. Um, and so that one is coming up at the gym. I, I don't remember what day it's coming up, but it is coming up and uh, yeah, it's exciting. So that's a good workout for you guys. Get motivated. It took me about nine minutes, little around nine minutes. Um, I will admit, um, I, I, maybe it could have gone faster, but I, uh, two things held me up and I'll just, I didn't bring grips to the gym. And so no. I was worried about tearing on the four bar muscle ups. That was a miss. And the other was I lost count of my rounds. So, um, I'm notoriously pretty bad at keeping track of my rounds. I probably should have had some poker chips out or chalk lines or something, but I just was kind of like, yeah, whatever. So, um, Anyways, I definitely did 10 rounds because I was I was making sure of that, but uh, it took me a little bit longer to realize if I had another round or not, maybe I could have gone a little bit faster. So wear grips and keep track of your rounds better. Should you wear grips though? Should people be wearing grips oh, okay. all the time? Oh, controversial, I, controversial yeah. Thursday. Um, so the grips that I wear, uh, I so when I first got into CrossFit, we were always looking for a different glove, a different grip, a different whatever to use because our hands were getting ripped up. I remember one time, actually, this is funny, and maybe it was like 2010, I went to the um, store, like a uh, Dick Sporting Goods, and I bought receiver gloves. Have you ever worn receiver gloves where they have yeah. the stickiness on? Uh -huh. <laughs> Bro, these things, you go to pull apart, you were just like stuck there. Um, and I don't know if it would have been legal to wear at the CrossFit Games or whatever, but it ended up being like too sticky where it was, there wasn't enough, there was no movement in there. I tried those. I tried, um, I tried all types of gloves, but ultimately I think the grips are the best option. And those are kind of founded in gymnastics, which we should have probably tried out earlier on naturally. But, um, I think you should wear grips when you think you're going to rip, um, if, but you should be building up the calluses in your hands as well. Yeah. I think that that's, a good suggestion to make. I think that, you know, the time of like the ripped hands being this, like, you know, but take a picture of it, like, you know, kind of like badge of honor, like check out my bloody hands. Like I, I know I'm personally way past that. Like the other day, actually I was doing um workout that was this week or maybe last weekend, but it was a Metcon workout. It had a couple sets of chest to bar pull-ups because I'm trying to get back into doing Metcons. And since I haven't been doing a lot of it, like on the fourth round, you know, I felt like when it start, like it rips under the skin, but it doesn't rip yet. 
And I immediately, immediately, even though I was moving pretty well in the workout and I was, I was, you know, I felt good about the time I would get. I just switched to doing strict kind of like, you know, like just more fingertips and finished the workout, got the volume in, but I was like, no more butterfly. Like me ripping my hand, especially like, you know, with the farm, like animals, like the last thing I need is like an open cut on my hand, like nightmare. And also like a big, you know, potential for like infection. I would have to be cleaning it all the time. So way past like, you know, 10 years ago, or maybe not 10 years ago, but like seven years ago, like you feel a rip going on. You're just going right through. You got to get the time. You got to climb the leaderboard. So that I think is good advice. On the flip side though, I think we have gotten to the point now, maybe not so much at, at, at our locations, because I think that we've done a really good job culturally at NC Fit to really make it about like the workout, the experience. And we don't have this like, hey, leaderboard or bust. But I know that like, for example, at my gym back home, I remember when there was like a fight for the spiel bar. Like, remember the sticky bar? Because we yeah. used to have we yeah. used to have a rig that was like, you know, the dirty south bars on on the outside of the rig, but the the middle ones would be yeah. those spiel bars that were right. the bare steel that were better. Oh, yeah. Dude, it was so funny. Like whenever we had a pull-up workout, it was like, all right, like pick your stations. And there's this weird, like, who's gonna get the spiel bar? Yeah, like, everybody wanted in? that like, bar. Oh, everyone wanted the bar. And now too, like, you know, like people will lose their minds if they forgot their grips for a pull-up workout. And I think that it's it's almost an overcorrection to the point where like, if you're that reliant on having a sticky bar and a grip to be able to like do a certain volume and you're not like training the grip or just being able to like do that, are you serving yourself best to get the most out of that workout? Yeah, I remember a while ago, I put out like a, a controversial statement and I'll say it again. You like, don't put out anything controversial. Yeah, no, this is, here it is. This is super controversial. <laughs> it's it's a choice to rip, was what I said. And people got like super mad at me. It's like, dude, it is. It's your choice to rip, in my opinion. To your point, if you're in the middle of a workout and you're starting to feel kind of like that bubbling up of underneath, you're choosing to continue on knowing that there's, you know, maybe a 50-50, maybe even a higher chance likelihood of that than ripping and or creating like this little blood blister underneath the skin never really rips but then over time you'll eventually have to uh, peel it off um but it's your choice because you start to feel it it doesn't it, it doesn't just immediately happen you start to feel a little bit in addition if you take care of your hands you shouldn't really rip meaning if you shave down your calluses if you have really bad calluses and you're not shaving them down that's a that's a miss i think that if you do have callus on your hand naturally like i do and you do or whatever a certain amount of callus is great, but once it starts to build up too much, you, you need to shave that down or file that down. Otherwise that clump starts to build up. And when you get on the pull-up bar, that's when it rips. Um, so I guess my, my advice would be choose not to rip. What can you do? Well, take care of your hands, make sure you, you shave down your calluses, make sure you know that when uh, you know, you're hitting a higher rep number, if you start to feel it, just adjust your position on the hand or, and, or switch to strict and, or do jumping pull-ups. You'll be fine. Um, and then, you know, if in addition, there's this option of grips. And I definitely think there's a time and a place for grips, just like I think there's a time and a place for a weight belt. Um, I think they both are similar. Um, it doesn't feel good to rip your hands. You know, for me, I did not rip on these bar muscle ups. I ended up doing 40. It, but I think if I had done maybe five more rounds, maybe I would have ripped. But I didn't want to rip because I'm competing in a jiu-jitsu tournament this Sunday. And I didn't want to have a ripped hand for a jiu-jitsu tournament. So those are the type of give and takes that I had to kind of switch my hand position. But if I had had grips, hell yeah, I would have worn them. Absolutely. I'm going to have to try that workout. That's a, that's a good one for me. That's a fun one. Bro, um, can you hit that 315? Oh, dude, of course. Hey, you know what my favorite uh, from the Rogue Invitational? What kind of question is that? God damn it. Dude, <laughs> dude my favorite one from the Rogue Invitational was uh, Josh Bridges. They announced the workout of the... Um, the one with the 405 back squat and uh, oh, box man. jump over. And then some Too dude writes, writes to Josh and is just like, can you even do that workout? And his response was like, yeah, but not in a time cap. I just thought that was funny. Like, can you even do that? But Well, I mean, one of the most iconic moments, or at least a moment that I definitely remember is Josh not being able to pull 405, being the only one in the final at the games. I forget what year when they had the Cinco 1 and the Cinco 2. And Josh was like the only one that made that final heat that couldn't pull 405. Oh yeah. You remember that? Yeah. That was a, that was a big deal because it was like, 
it was the, the really heavy deadlifts and then like handstand walk and a bunch of stuff that Josh would have crushed, yes. but he just couldn't pull 405. He couldn't get it off the ground. Dude. Yeah. There was single one and single two. I, yep. I can't remember the other, there was another one, maybe it was handstand pushups and like something with kettle. I, 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 I'll have to look that up. Um, Oh no, no. Wasn't it heavy kettlebell deadlifts? I'll have to look it up. Maybe but, the Cinco two was, but I just remember like it, it, it must've been so frustrating, man. Oh, just, for sure. but the four Oh five. I'm going to look that up right now. Um, yeah. CrossFit Cinco one and two. Let's see what they are. Um, okay, here we go. Cinco number one, this is 2013 CrossFit Games, So I was definitely there for this. Cinco one is five deadlifts at four Oh five. So you were right. Five uh, weighted one-legged squats. That's what it was with a kettlebell. Five right hand and then 80-foot handstand walk. That was Cinco one. Okay. And that um, was the that was the most frustrating part for him was literally it started with that. So like yeah. he never even got to like, you know, do the other stuff. And then I was right. And then we were kind of right on this one. Cinco two was five muscle-ups, five deficit handstand push-ups. And then 50 foot overhead walking lunge with a pretty heavy axle bar. So I remember that year in particular because, um, you know, Froney and I were kind of battling it out for first and second um, that whole that whole time. And to finish it off with Cinco one and two, I needed to perform really well. And I, I performed well, just not well enough to take over the lead. I ended up taking second that year. But I, I remember distinctly, um, you know, it's the last event of the last weekend and you're just overhead walking lunges. And I was trying to catch Ben Smith. And I think I ended up catching him. But it's like, it's those moments where you have this weight over your head. It, oh, man, that was, that was, that. anyways, thanks for bringing that back up. I appreciate that. That was, that was a good one for me. That was fun. I remember that, that, that was a fun event. Um, the other thing that the workout you, you were saying, which I'm, I'm definitely going to do, I'll report back on the podcast next week. Um, dude, deadlift box room combinations quickly learned as a coach that it's one of the places where you have to be more ca most cautious of people like bumping their shin or falling on the box. Like it's, it's super, super like people don't realize how much of a box jump is that opening of the hip and how exhausted that is after heavy deadlift specifically. Like people think like, you know, if you're doing squats or something, something that blows up your legs, they almost go to the box and they're like prepared. They're like, okay, this is going to be a tough jump, yeah. jump high. If you're deadlifting your legs, your quads, feel fine but you go to like open the hip explosively to jump on a box and dude you don't get anywhere near as far as you thought for sure for sure i, I dude i agree with that 100 percent. by the way I'm, I'm playing around with this uh this fidget ball this i was i was showing it to you from a company called naboso i just have to we are not sponsored there's nothing here but i got this from mark bell but how cool is this design so you take like this ball that you could then open up and you could create two halves where you could put your foot on top and then inside, there's a separate ball. Like, look how efficient that is from like a mobility tool perspective. Pretty good design, right? Pretty good design. Yeah. Anyways, it's just something I'm, yeah, anyways. So, Fidgeting with. The latest uh, fidget toy. Uh, yeah, I got that in my African, uh, my African uh, uh, Maasai club. Um, speaking of fidget toys uh, and us going out to Tim Kennedy, remember all those toys? I'm hitting up Sheepdog uh, next week. So I'll have to report back on that experience because you did that, um, you know, a couple months ago. And so I'll be doing it, you know, pretty soon. Yeah, man. I mean, it's a really cool course. I know we've talked it on here, talked about it on here before. Um, and I think it brings up another thing we wanted to talk about and just kind of how we're starting to dip our toes in, in an area that I know you're super passionate about. And that, you know, I, I think is a huge area of opportunity. You know, we always talk about helping people live freely and fully outside the gym. That's, that's our mission at NC fit. That's what we want to do with our brand of fitness. And, you know, this, this applies to it a little bit, but maybe not in the way that a lot of people think, you know, people always think like, you know, you want to be able to play with your kids forever. You don't want to be able to like held back up by your fitness. But I think that in this area of like, being a protector, but also like, you know, if you work in law enforcement or if you like literally the level of your fitness and you being able to like use your body is like a part of your job and also not just a part of your job, but a part of your job that like, you know, can sometimes be a life and death scenario can sometimes, you know, like stakes are super high. I think that the fact that we're getting into the space of hopefully being able to help, you know, 
first responders with their fitness so they can be better equipped to do their job is something I know I'm really excited about and something that I think is is a big problem that we can help solve. And that, that to me is exciting in itself. You're on mute. Yeah, I mean, we've had great conversations recently. Like this has been a big week for us here at NC Fit, um, in particular for LEO, military, and this general protector idea. So, you know, I'm going out to Texas um, when this releases, actually, I'll be basically on a plane um, heading out to Texas to work with some guys. I'm 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 participating in the sheepdog course. And what that is, if you haven't listened to the previous episodes, is it's a course that's really designed to teach uh, self-awareness, situational awareness. Um, but primarily it's it's firearms training and self-defense. That's primarily what it is. And, you know, although I, I feel like I've had some exposure there. I could always continue to learn. And so I'm participating in this course. I'm very excited about all of it. And then and then during and after, I will be um, working with the team over there to design a fitness curriculum to help people who want to become this basic protector. And, you know, what we're finding is that, you know, people might have great hand-to-hand -hand combat. They might even have great pistol, you know, skills. But if they can't breathe, they can't function, they can't move. That's a, that's a, that's a problem. And so we want to be able to provide a solution for the general baseline fitness for any protector, which I think carries over really well into LEO. You know, when we look at law enforcement and what they do as, as a, for a job, I mean, oh man, it's, it's a lot, it's a very difficult job and you never know who you're going to come up on. You never know what the situation is going to be. And if we could provide a level of fitness to help them get there and be more efficient, that's what we're really passionate about. So we'll continue to talk more about it. We're working with several departments. If you are a part of a department and you want to talk about fitness, um, I'd love to be a part of that conversation. Please hit us up. Um, it's something that I'm particularly really passionate about. You know, selfishly, if I ever have to call the police and they show up to my house, I want them to be as fit as possible and as capable as possible to help me. And then non-selfishly, obviously, I want them to be able to help the rest of the community. And um, I think fitness is a major component that we can make an impact on. So we're pursuing it heavily here at NC Fit. And we'll keep you guys up to date on when things really solidify, we'll, we'll share them with you for sure. Yeah. And on like a super relevant anecdote that just happened last week. So I, I live in a relatively small town, um, Seguin, Texas. And so this past week, there was an incident at like the HEB, which is like the big supermarket, like the single Heb, big bro, supermarket. Heb, Heb. It's HEB. Don't, don't say that around <laughs> any Texans. Um, there was a, an incident where a gentleman walked in, was clearly a bit unstable. Um, so cops were called, tried to get him outside to kind of talk to him. Didn't work out. He like started running through the store. So they had to chase him, bring him down. And there was a video of it kind of circulating through like local Facebook groups and, and next door and, and stuff like that. Since, you know, small town, everything gets around. And watching the video, man, it was, it, it just became very, obvious to me how much better that specific situation would have been handled had the cops involved been in better shape just just putting it like super bluntly and um you know it, it's unfortunate because you know at nc fit I know, I know you feel this way i feel this way as well you know very pro leo i think that they have a very tough job i think that you know they're they're out there trying to protect communities and it's a shame that they're not given the kind of resources and, and knowledge to really, you know, step up their nutrition and fitness, because they're also, you know, these are people that are probably working night shifts and sure. super high stress jobs. And if there's anything I know about nutrition specifically, it's if you're in a very high stress job, if you're not sleeping adequately, like nutrition becomes that much more important, you're going to retain fat a lot more, you're going to be a lot more craved for like sugary foods, if you're super high stress, like they have so much working against them. And I think that sometimes it's easy to just be like, you know, oh, well, cops are always out of shape and just kind of like, oh, it's on them, it's on them. But I do think that there's just a lack of a solution there. Because, you know, are the academies teaching, you know, people that are going through it, proper nutrition and proper fitness? I mean, we've come to realize with the conversations we've had that they're not. So it's exciting to hopefully be able to play that role in that system and, and, you know, help departments um, in, in a way that I think could be super impactful, not just for them, but for the communities they serve, right? Like having fitter cops, I think is something that anyone out there would want 
in their community. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for us, this isn't like us, there, there's no bashing here. It's, it's, it's actually, um, I'd say it's, it's exciting opportunity, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a specific need that I think we could help address. And I think getting it in the, in the academy, I think is really important because you set the tone of like, Hey, this fitness thing, it's not as complicated as people make it sound. We just need to teach people how to do it right, how often to do it and create a baseline that would help them perform. And then nutrition. Yeah, you're right, man. Like, I mean, dude, I think it's so easy. And this goes for any, uh, many professions. Like, I mean, I can only imagine how difficult it must be as a truck driver to maintain your fitness. Like, could you imagine if you're driving 12 hours or whatever it is and you're sitting and then you only have like these truck stops you have to find and you have to like make good food choices or prepare your food ahead of time. Like for me, I have to give those the different communities a little bit more like a, of grace in that sense. Cause like for what I do, I mean, dude, I have a typical sleep schedule. I I'm at a gym right now, as we speak, like I do have an advantage over these guys that are out and about. So if we could share best practices that we've learned and then kind of like on a baseline level, let them, you know, find ways to make it work with their schedules. That's, that's the key moving forward, man, is to help make an impact, especially because I do think there's a lot. And I think this is really important to note from my, from my experiences, there is many people in law enforcement and military that have a desire to improve the overall baseline of fitness for the general, for them. They do, they have a desire, they need support, but it's, but the, the it's there, you know what I mean? It's not like these guys are oblivious to it. They want to make an impact. And, um, I'm excited for the next couple of years. I think there's going to be a big shift and fitness can be more of a cultural component in a lot of these departments, which I'm, which I'm fired up about, obviously. <laughs> yeah, man, if we can play a role in that, I think that that's a, a, a really cool aspect that I think NC fit can have a greater impact. You know, obviously we have a huge impact in the Bay area with our members there, but being able to have an impact kind of nationwide by working with these different departments, I think is, is super exciting. I mean, it, it gets me fired up. So I'm excited we're doing it and I'm excited to see where the conversations go. Yeah. Yeah. It's all part of the, you know, our, our plan, right. To impact as many people as we can with through, through fitness. And, you know, we're starting to talk a little bit more about nutrition, which I think is really you know, nutrition has been an area that I haven't really wanted to touch for 15 years. And I think that's been a miss. You know, I think for any gym owner listening here, one of the things that I've had my eyes open to is like, you know, I should have been more open-minded to nutrition. I, it's not that I was like anti-nutrition talk, of course. Like, I think that's really important. I just always said like, hey, NC Fit, we're going to stay in this lane. We're going to be, you know, doing our classes. We're going to be group training, et cetera. And we're not going to mess with the nutrition because it's kind of outside of our scope. And I think at the end of the day, I think that's that's a lost opportunity for a bunch of reasons, not only from a business perspective, but from an impact in the members perspective. You know, you have members that come in for years and they don't see the visible change they want. And I think that uh, we're doing them a disservice by not providing a resource for them. And we have some basic resources, but it's time for us to level up our game. So we're, we're on that charter. We will keep you, um, any gym owner listening, we will keep you apprised of like what we're doing and how we're doing it and the success or non-success we see, because uh, I think that'll be important to you as well. Yeah, man. Nutrition, something else I'm super passionate about. You know, we've been putting out some really good information. I mention this all the time, but our EOE weekly emails, if you haven't signed up for it, make sure you do. The link is in the show notes. Um, but the last one, you know, because we, we went through this eight-week series in those emails. They're all on the blog now, kind of touching on different healthy habits and why they're important and how you can build them. But this last one was really focused on, okay, now you have all this information. Here are all these habits that you probably were like, eh, I can probably do a little bit better on this, this, and that. So you've identified kind of your lowest hanging fruit. The next step is like, okay, like how can you actually make those habits stick? Because we've all been there, right? You're like, hey, I can sleep a little bit better. I can spend a little bit less time on my phone. I can hydrate better. You're really good about it for three weeks. And the next thing you know, you're back at square one and you're back to doing what you were doing. And one thing that I that I wrote about and that I think is worth talking about here is this idea, and I, I forgot where I heard it, but this idea of like aiming low with your habits. You know, so many times when people talk about like goals, it's like aim high, like, you know, like, you know, set a goal that's like really tough to attain, like get after it. And I think that's all well and good. I agree. But I think that when you're trying to build a habit, sometimes people end up aiming too high. And what I mean by that is you're like, okay, January 1st, I'm going to be a new person. I'm going to sleep eight hours a night. 
eat just meat. Full carnivore. Full um, carnivore. Yeah. Like work out seven times a week. Great. But what's going to happen? You're going to grit your teeth and get through three weeks of it perfectly. And then the first thing in, in life is going to happen, whatever that is, you know, a stressful week at work, um, having to go to a wedding, you name it, right? Something that throws you off your, your, your street, your groove. And it gets really hard to go back because you, you picked a, a, a kind of target that was so, so, so high that, you know, you kind of exhausted your discipline for, for three weeks. Cause one thing, one, one way that I like to think about it is I think we all have like a discipline bucket every day that we pull from for various things, whether it's, you know, making the right food choices, whether it's, you know, like talking to your kid the right way, like it, it could be anything, but you're pulling from this like discipline bucket. Right. And at some point you're going to run out. And I think that's why, for example, a lot of people end up going crazy on the snacking at night. Because if you're so like uh, to like wound tight during the day, if you're so like, I'm going to be perfect, I can't do this, I can't do that, there's always going to get to a point, whether it's at night or whether it's the weekend, where you're out of the, that discipline in the discipline bucket and like all hell runs loose. So this idea of aiming low is just pick one thing and make it seem like super easy. Maybe it's not you being perfect. Maybe it's like, hey, I'm going to go from working out twice a week to three times a week. Maybe it's something as simple as like, I'm going to have a banana every day. Cause I don't need enough fruits or vegetables. Like it might seem comically easy and not like a challenge, not like, Oh my God, I'm doing whole 30 or 75 hard. But I think that sometimes that's what allows you to next thing, you know, it's been six weeks and you've been doing the small habit that you thought wasn't a big deal. And it doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel like you're doing anything. It's just what you do. It's like brushing your teeth. And what that allows you to do is build on the next thing. And again, make it easy again. And then over time, you look back at where you were three months ago and you're like, wow, now I eat a bunch more vegetables. I'm sleeping more. I'm hydrating. But it never felt like this thing where I'm doing so much that like I can't wait to like have a cheat day or I can't wait to like it be the weekend and me relax, right? Like it just felt like this gradual increase to where in three months you're like a completely different person, but you didn't do it this drastic kind of challenge at a time. Yeah, the discipline bucket is a phenomenal idea. And I imagine your bucket gets bigger over time because uh, you, you, right? But like, I, I could totally relate to the discipline bucket. And I think that's something that I think a lot of people that probably listen to the show can relate to. I imagine many people that listen have a certain level of discipline for sure, including myself. But at some point throughout the day, I think it's okay to realize like, hey man, your bucket's been emptied and like, maybe it's it's okay. Like, I'll give you an example. I have pretty good discipline, you know, I, I have pretty good discipline in terms of like my workouts and, you know, certain things, but like, what's difficult for me sometimes is like the cold plunge and early morning workouts. Those are two areas where like my bucket is like not ready. It's not, it's not ready yet. Like, for example, this morning I was in the garage with Ava. I'm there every day. She does like a hard workout. That's where her discipline levels at. And then throughout the duration of the day, she doesn't really do, you know, she does regular activity, whatever. For me in the morning, like, dude, I, I do not have the discipline to work out hard in the morning. I just can't do it. I just, I ride the bike. I hit that. Okay. But if you ask me to do like a hard workout in the morning, I'm just not there. I'm not, I'm not mentally ready. And then same thing goes to the cold plunge, dude. Sometimes like I'll have a hard day of training. I'll hit, you know, a workout at the gym. I'll go do jujitsu. I'll be super dedicated to my food. I'll be on point. And I'll just get home and I'll be like, dude, I just, I do not have the discipline to hit that plunge. And uh, sometimes I just got to be okay with that. You know, like it's not every day, but some days like that bucket just empties and I should just be okay with it. You know, like I totally relate to the discipline. But <laughs> I love that idea. And I think that like it, building on that analogy a little bit, because I've thought about this a lot. Um, you know, I think you have to realize that some things take a lot more discipline than others. And being able to like, you know, prioritize accordingly, I think is important, right? Like, for example, for you, like, oh, getting in a workout a day is super important, we should all do it. But for you, it would take a lot to get it done in the morning, where you can come in, take the noon class at NC Fit, it's a group environment, you're there anyway, it's a better time of day. So is it really worth you digging deep into that discipline bucket just to work out in the morning, as opposed to noon? Or is it better for you to save that so you can work on maybe some of the other things that 
you know, is more low hanging fruit because you're getting a workout in anyway. And I think that what some people do sometimes is they work so hard on getting on something they're already 90% good at getting a hundred percent because they want to ignore the thing that they're 20% good at that they could really work to get 50%. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's really, that's an interesting analogy about the workout because if you only have so much discipline in your bucket and me doing a workout in the morning takes a lot of like hard work and discipline. I just don't like it. My body doesn't feel ready. I just, I typically am waking up pretty sore. Like I beat myself up pretty good. That takes a lot for me to like mentally and physically want to go do that. Now I ride the bike, but that's not like a big deal. But whereas in the middle of the day or something, it's pretty easy for me to go do that. That's an interesting analogy about that, that discipline component, because I wonder over time, if you told yourself you had to work out in the morning, like how much that would just beat you up versus giving yourself the opportunity to work out any time throughout the day. And that same thing can relate to, I imagine other things like, for example, the cold plunge, it's really tough, dude. And I'm in California. And so I know like other people are gonna be listening in different parts of the country and be like, bro, what are you talking <laughs> about? Like I'm in California, but it's cold here in the morning sometimes. And it is hard to get in that plunge. Whereas later in the day, it's a lot easier. So maybe like from a discipline meter, I should be okay and just do it later in the day. But um, anyways, you're bringing up a really interesting analogy. I got to figure out exactly how to like hone this thing. Cause I might steal it for a cop of Kalipa because I, I like <laughs> this. I like this theory, right? That like certain things can pull more discipline out of your, require more out of your bucket. And at the end of the day, if you, if you only have a certain amount of water in your bucket and you try really hard in the morning to work out and you pull a lot from that water, well, if you had just done it later in the day, maybe I'd pulled less, you have more discipline available for other things like nutrition or learning a new skill or whatever it might be that you want to do. <laughs> yeah. And I think that the analogy is, is cause I've thought it a lot in terms of nutrition. You know, one of the things that I, I tend to personally disagree with a little bit is the approach to helping people with nutrition where it's like very black or white. It's very like, you know, and we've had this talk with MDB. I know he disagrees with me. Like there are bad foods. There are good foods. Like avoid the bad food, avoid the bullshit. I, obviously there are bad foods. There are foods that like don't have nutritional value. It's junk. You probably shouldn't eat them. With that being said though, like sometimes people become so fixated on these are the bad foods that are going to make me sick, so on and so forth, but they enjoy them because they're meant to be enjoyed, right? Like they're super sweet, super palatable. And that's why a lot of people, because I know a lot of people, you know, blueberry with muffin this. with, with a little bit of crumble on top is my oh, go-to. Dude, dude, just, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, like almond croissants. I love Ooh, almond croissants. Give me an almond croissant. If you like make yourself never touch those foods, eventually like, you know, it's going to be the straw that broke the camel's back, man. And you're going to go crazy. Whereas I think that an approach of moderation and understanding that you can have these things every now and then, and it's not going to like, you know, completely ruin a goal that you're chasing for a lot of people. And I honestly think most people could be the thing that doesn't make it so that you go absolutely crazy from Friday night to Sunday, which a lot of people do because you're quote unquote good from Monday to Thursday, and you're not eating enough, you're not having enough carbs, you're, you know, like starving yourself of things that like genuinely bring you joy. Does that mean that you should go out there? And if you're not eating junk, like just purposefully find junk to add to your diet? No. But if you're someone that like is genuinely struggling to bring down the amount of foods that maybe you shouldn't be eating that much, Try like having a little bit throughout the week and getting to the point where like you don't get to Friday or the weekends and you're just like absolutely starving for it. Um, because I also feel like, you know, it's it's easy to have these recommendations of like, hey, there are bad foods, avoid them at all costs. If you're in the situation where, you know, you don't have kids, you're with a partner that like is completely in line with where you're at, like that takes less of that discipline from the discipline bucket. But like, for example, for me, you know, my wife is 34 weeks pregnant. And at one point in the pregnancy, you know, she was like, she really wanted to have chicken nuggets in the house. It was something that like, she like had a craving for, right? Go grab them. Hell yeah. <laughs> like when people say, oh, don't have food like that at the house. Like, what am I supposed to say? Like, no, we can't have this at the house. Like, it doesn't matter that you want this now that you're like 30 something weeks pregnant. Like, no, right? 
And I, I'm sure the same. I'm down happens, for a good chicken nugget, by the way. But I'm sure the same thing happens once you have kids, right? Like there are foods that the kids are going to want to have around the house. And I'm not saying you should have junk around for the kids, but there's food that's going to be around the house that maybe isn't ideal, but like it's at the house. It's part of your circumstances that you live in now. And I think that you being equipped to have that around and maybe enjoy it every now in moderation is healthier than having this like black and white thinking of, well, I can never have that. And like, every time you go to the pantry, it takes so much discipline to like get out of there and not reach for, you know, the, the little kids fruit snacks or whatever it is that you have in there, just have it every now and then and understand that moderation actually means moderation. I think that it's such a better way to look at it because otherwise you're going to deplete that discipline bucket and you're going to be in a really bad place where you're just binge eating a whole bunch of stuff or, you know, leaning on things like wine to de-stress and stuff like that, which then we get to a slippery slope. Yeah, I, got, right? I, had a, I had a little, I had a martini last night. Woo! <laughs> hey, but in all seriousness, man, I think what you're talking about just comes with age and comes with perspective. In my opinion, you know, I, I had kids relatively young um, and, you know, Ashley and I have a slightly different viewpoints on slightly, not, not huge, slightly different viewpoints on fitness and nutrition. And I learned early on that like, dude, I've pushed a lot of people away in my life and, and from being too over the top. And so I just really started to just moderate how aggressive I was with certain things. And it's been great having Ashley in my life, obviously, because she, she helped me moderate that. Like, dude, for so many years of my life, man, we'd be at restaurants with CrossFitters talking about just CrossFit nonstop eating super clean. And it just, it, it started to impact mine and Ashley's relationship because she didn't want to just be just eating, you know, zone diet or paleo all the time. She wanted to have different exposures. And I, th I found that a balance of everything is the way to go. Like, dude, I'll rock some cereal, man. I love cereal. Like cereal is awesome. Like, dude, give me some life cereals and, and, and I could have that in the cupboard and it's not a big deal. You know, I, I think that this idea just comes over time. I think that, you know, if you're newer into CrossFit or just found paleo and you're seeing all these results, give it a few years. And I think you'll evolve, especially once your family grows and people around you have slightly different viewpoints, you'll realize it's not always so cut and dry. It really isn't. Um, you got to be willing to kind of be limber. Like for example, with you, Gabe, like, dude, if my wife came up to me and was like, Hey bro, or Hey, I need you to go to the store and get me Chick-fil-A. I'd be like, okay. Or I need you to go to get me some frozen chicken nuggets. Absolutely. What else do you need? You know, like, and that's fine. Like, it's, it's going to be okay. Like it's all good. Yeah. It's all yeah. good, dude. I, I, it, I just think this idea to like the way that I want to approach nutrition and we could, we, I'm, I'm excited to talk more about this. I still think there's areas that I can improve on, but I look at nutrition the same way I look at fitness. You know, I want my children to have a good relationship with fitness and I want them to be as fit as possible for all the days of their life. I want them to look at it as a resource and a tool for the rest of their life. The same thing applies for nutrition, right? We need to be able to find especially this goes for kids. Like uh, it's, uh, this is a really touchy subject for parents with kids, but it's like, if you're too over the top, they could resent you. If you're not educating at all, they don't know. It's finding this beautiful balance. And I think, you know, I, I grew up one way. I'm trying to raise the kids a little bit different where we, we talk about certain things, but we talk about it in a way that doesn't make them like, yeah, it's, it's, it's something we've had to, we've had to talk about as a family because, you know, at one point, uh, Ava said something to another kid, like, Oh, you're, you're eating that. Right. Like it was like a pizza pizza or something. And it, it got back to us. And like, she said this, and I, I had to talk to her about like, Hey, like don't place your viewpoints on other people. Like, and don't make them feel bad if they want to eat a piece of pizza. Like it, it's, it's okay. You know? And, and that's a learning experience for the family, you know, for sure, man, for sure. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate that it's a touchy subject and it can't just be talked about a little bit more openly. Um, you know, people get very guarded when it comes to nutrition. And I think that part of the, part of the reason that we're there is because of this black and white thinking of their bad foods and their good foods, because if you're using the, like words do matter. And I think that, you know, if you're someone listening to someone talking and like saying that all these are bad foods and you're thinking, well, damn, I eat mostly bad foods. Like, the words matter. And does that mean that you're doing the wrong thing? Or does that just mean that, you know, you haven't had the, the, the proper kind of like education or support system to get you out of a shitty situation? Because we live in a, we live in a system where like, you can go into a grocery store and wait online 
without having to spend five minutes literally surrounded on both sides by absolute junk, right? Like it's, it's, it's really, really tough. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the, and the information is so readily available. Like I'll, I'll, I'll have Ava and I'm, I, this is a really, this is a really something that's important to me. Ava will come to the table with information and she'll honestly think that she has it all figured out. Like, 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 so, you know, I used to think that I knew everything and whatever, but I didn't have the same access to information that Ava has now. Ava could be on, which we regulate a lot of this, but let's just use, for example, like her TikTok. I think she has a TikTok that she could go on or the internet in general. And she'll have her friends that have access to other things. And they'll come to the table and be like, dude, you gotta, for example, get rid of straws. Okay, get rid of straws. All right, I understand. Okay, then it's like, all right, well, this food is terrible for you. And it's like, we're talking about, I don't know, quinoa, let's just say it's oh, because no. they yeah, saw yeah. something online yeah. that said that quinoa is the worst thing in the world because, and and it's, it's, it's difficult because in this day and age of information, anybody could put out anything and, and they want to get clickbait. And so they make it like really aggressive. So anyways, I don't envy where we're at because of how fast information can flow and how, if you look at it and you only read that one article, you can make anything seem terrible. Right. But it's like, <laughs> Anyways, we could talk about this for hours, by the way. Yeah, no, it's so true, man. Um, one one side note, because I want to give our, our partners Element a shout out. Um, you were talking about the cold plunge. Last night, I went in the cold plunge. So usually my routine, be, like to break up the work day and then night school that I've been taking is I'll do 15 minutes in the sauna, followed by three minutes in the cold plunge, shower, and then I'll sit down for night so school. So much that's easier coming out of the sauna, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't know about so much easier, but easier for sure. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I finish on the cold plunge. So I come back in and I'm cold and I had the new element caramel hot chocolate. Like that was my like nighttime drink. And dude, it, there's nothing better than like getting into a pair of sweats after showering, after being in the cold plunge and having like a warm sweet drink and knowing that it has like the electrolytes that you need and stuff. So if you haven't checked out element, wait, the so link was is in the show notes. Though? Well, no. Yeah. So yes, because I've only had the original chocolate from them. And when I mixed it, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think I mixed it with coffee and it just didn't hit the spot for me. That's I, not I the didn't... move. No, in coffee, isn't the move I've tried it and it is not the move. So what's the move? Especially, then? Just... especially if you like coffee, like if you yeah. like coffee and you put anything in coffee, it just makes you not like coffee. So don't recommend it unless you're like someone that usually likes putting sweet stuff in your coffee. But I tried that too and it didn't work. This was just, I put it in water and then um, I top it off with a little bit of almond milk. Um, hot so water. Hot water, the chocolate caramel element. element. Really? And top it off with a little bit of, of almond milk if you want it like a, a smidge creamier. It's and delicious. there's sugar in it? There's, um, I don't know if it's, I, I think it's stevia. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I haven't tried that, but- yeah, element. Look, I'm I'm getting ready for a jiu-jitsu tournament here in two days, and I'm gonna completely lean on them uh, to help me like get the mental clarity I need and and the re rehydration that I need. Um, so make sure to check out the podcast show notes for a link. Um, we send them out, or they could get uh, a free like variety pack, right? Yeah, that includes the chocolate, so you can try the chocolate. The new chocolate? Mm, I don't think the new one, but the chocolate, which is also good. So even if you had the regular chocolate, you would just do hot water, chocolate, mm -hmm. a little bit of almond milk. Yeah. Okay. So I, that's where I think I went wrong. I think I went wrong because I did coffee. No, don't put it in your coffee. Coffee's, coffee's good on its own, man. Dude, coffee's great on its own. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, dude, we got an exciting week coming up. Um, you know, as per usual, really appreciate everybody, you know, check out these episodes, listening. I, uh, I finally got the new podcast set up, like rocking and rolling here at the gym. We are recording officially tomorrow. Today's Thursday. Tomorrow, I'm recording a, an episode with Nikki and Frankie on how to run a successful, uh, uh, you know, event at the gym. And we just, yeah, the fall flex off. We just got done doing it. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to break in our new podcast studio. So stay tuned for that episode. If you're a gym owner, you're going to love that one. Uh, any kind of final remarks here, Gabe? No, man, this is a really fun conversation. I'm, I'm excited to follow up on on kind of how we're diving a little deeper into nutrition at NC Fit and how we're diving a little bit deeper into, you know, helping at, at LEO and and kind of, you know, helping protectors have a baseline of fitness. So two interesting topics that I know we're going to have a lot more to talk about. 
as we dive in deeper with with those two offerings. Yeah, just continuing to share what we're doing and yeah, hope they raise the bar and keep doing your thing. Make sure to remind you guys about the discipline bucket. I'll probably be stealing that for a couple of people. So if you're not listening to those episodes, make sure you do that. Share the episode with a friend and keep getting after it. Oh,